Welcome to another episode of the Armed and Ready podcast. Today we have a really exciting guest. We have Felicia Rexford, who is an Air Force veteran, a real estate agent, and a big real estate investor. We are going to talk about some of her experiences as being a woman in the military, what she's seen around the world, and now as a, as a female entrepreneur. So we can't wait to bring this episode to you. Felicia, so women around the world yes. get treated pretty terribly, <laughs> um, honestly. And I mean, it's probably hard for us living in America to envision to, yeah, correct. what that's like. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to get your perspective because, you know, through your military service, you've seen different mm-hmm. parts of the world and you've seen how women get treated there. You're a woman in the military, so mm-hmm. there's treatment there. Like, so I want to get your, your vision yeah. of what you've seen. And I knew kind of where you were going with that. So I don't think that women get, you know, treated terribly like we, like here in this country. But yes, having That's, seen, yeah. having seen, so I got yeah. you, having seen how you're treated abroad made me come back to America and be like, what limitations do I have? I don't have any. And I really don't want to hear from people that are like, oh, we, st- I, no, I really feel limitless in this country. Like nothing is going to hold me back. Yeah. I'm standing on stages, I'm being handed mics, I'm at being asked my opinion, I'm sitting at tables with men, um, and I just feel super empowered because of my military background, right? right. So um, not everybody is going to have the opportunity to serve, and it really was one of my biggest blessings, really, for a lot of different reasons, but one of them being, you know, when you deploy... Um, and yes, I was one of like hundreds of men and flying in on the C-130 and, you know, being literally one of two ladies, you know, yeah. surrounded by these big old men going, what the f- am I doing, you know? <laughs> um, so many moments like that, right? But um, but being, let's say, in Iraq and seeing how women are just, um, they're just nothing, really. They really are, they're not even on... Um, a notable scale. So uh, they are what we call baby makers over there. They're, yeah. they're things to make babies, and that's about it. You don't have a voice. You don't have a say. You don't have anything. And then they're just surrounded by war, and it's just sad. You look at these women, their eyes just look sad, you know? Um, so, yes, having done that gave me the opportunity for some perspective because I came back here, and I had a beautiful career as a drone sensor operator, instructor, evaluator, and I was a contractor, mm-hmm. and I was making six figures, and I was doing really well. But I just knew that I wanted even more. I wanted more freedoms. I wanted to work for myself. Um, obviously, I loved real estate. I wanted to bet on myself, you know. And at some point, you got to take those life lessons and yep. perspective and be like, what is holding me back? More often than not, it's ourselves. 100%. It's, it's us, you know. So I came here and I just have this concept now of just being limitless, you know, and I don't know when my day is done. I don't know if it's today, tomorrow, a month from now or two years from now, but I'm not going to live by putting limitations on myself and I'm not going to allow other people to put limitations on myself, whether that be their vision of me as a woman or whatever it is, you know, like I, it's just not going to happen with me. And that mindset and that concept that I have has just, I think, just, I, I, I'm not afraid to have the conversations. I'm not afraid for the introductions. I'm not afraid to be rejected. I'm not afraid for negative comments. I'm not afraid of any of that stuff. I have no limitations on myself. It's a very freeing um, place to be. So, Well, I think our society really has, the, the self, like you mentioned, like it's self-inflicted, right? Mm-hmm. So those limitations and those ceilings, it's all self-inflicted, right? And I hear from people all the time who even just go travel abroad to, you know, countries that kind of suck and they come back here. They're like, holy cow. Like we have it so much better. We have water and water bottles, right? That's still not accessible all over the world. You know, like the most basic of things. We're sitting here drinking water, probably not even thinking two things about that. There are still people that don't have accessible water. It's unbelievable. It really is. It's unbelievable. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the opportunity is just, it's massive, mm-hmm. right? But you don't realize it until you get outside. Like we see, you know, like especially the youth today with like, oh, America's terrible and America sucks yeah. and this, that, and anything. And it's like, you know what? Go, go spend a month in Iraq mm-hmm. and come back or, or go to Russia for a little while mm-hmm. and then come back here and, and tell, tell us how great that was, how much better was that? Mm-hmm. Because 
that is so diametrically different than what we actually have mm -hmm. here, right? And you've been able to witness that firsthand. Yeah, it's one of my biggest blessings. You know, people always say thank you for your service, and I'm and I'm like thank you for that acknowledgement. But it it was one of my biggest blessings that I was blessed with the opportunity to serve and to gain that perspective and understanding, and then to come back here and be like, Whew, all right, let's go. Yeah, and you I know? feel the same way. Like when people say thank you, like of course I'm appreciative. Right. But it's like. And I was grateful yeah. to be able to, like, I wanted to. It wasn't like someone twisted my arm, like, yeah, you better go. Yeah. I, I was, since I was young, I wanted to serve. Yeah. Right? So it was what, my honor. What's your perspective on, um, I, my husband and I talk about this, I'm just wondering. Yeah. Uh, well, what's, what's your perspective on, like, mandating or ever, you know, mandating a certain timeline that kids graduate high school and maybe go serve for a year or two? Have you ever talked about that or thought yes. about that? What's your All thoughts on that? I am all the way for it. I I think, um, I think it would do a lot for our country. Me too. I, as as we see, and I, I see these polls on TV, and it just it absolutely just honestly breaks my heart when they when they poll different um, age groups of people in our country on like patriotism related questions and like what their percentage of people who are patriotic for you know love of our country and who are not, and it's mm -hmm. such a small number right now. Mm -hmm. It's it's almost reminiscent of like. Um, youth in the 60s, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. almost the same oh, percentages. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think um, if we were mandated as as young people, you know, at 18 years old or whatever, that we had to give a one or two year mandated commitment to serve in the military, mm -hmm. it would make this, I think we have the greatest nation on earth. Mm -hmm. I think it would take that and blow it out of the water a hundredfold. Me too. Um, the, the amount of discipline and respect that you get for this country like to this day if i hear the national anthem i get goosebumps yeah every single time yeah right and like there's parts of like my va loan presentation that i do that like i am um, i get, get choked i up. get choked yeah, up on it same. you know mm -hmm. and um but that doesn't come from because i went to public high school like it didn't yeah. come from that yeah right it came from that time wearing the service. uniform yeah absolutely so and watching people not come back i flew back on a medevac a c-17 medevac from Iraq with three tiered bodies, you know, high. And I just sat there happy to be flying back to Germany, you know, and but just looking at Alive. guys, yeah, stacked up and wedding rings hanging off the beds and stuff like that. It is an eye opener. I'm I'm hundred percent with you. My husband and I have talked about this for years. I think that it would give structure, it would help be a resume builder. It would give um, accountability, mm -hmm. um, so many things that I, I feel like when I graduated high school, I was like thr thrown to the wind, you know, and yeah. I was waitressing and putting myself through college. You're trying to figure s yourself out. And not everybody has a home life that helps or accommodates them with like nurturing and blossom child. Not everybody has that. Some right. people kind of need that structure. So I'm, I'm right there with you. I, I can't even imagine the country that we would have if everybody just went and did a year or two years um, service, you yeah, know? And I think, I think for, so like, huge. for young men, because, I mean, men mature slower than women do, I think the maturity it would help for that 18-, 19-year-old kid to be, to be a man mm -hmm. and be able to function in our society in a productive, effective way mm -hmm. would be huge. Yeah. And then, and then you, like you, if we had a generation where that happened, mm -hmm. fast forward to now – they're all in their 50s, 60s, and they're running for Congress and mm -hmm. for Senate. And imagine the changes in our country and how it's run and operated at the federal level, the state level, the city yes, level. Yes, yes. Like, you put these people who love the country in charge, and the whole perspective changes mm -hmm. on how everything is done. And yeah. I think it gives us give us a baseline for a greater freedom. Yeah, I agree. I love it. I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, by the no, way. It's, it's a, just a I conversation like that we have a lot. And... Uh, and I've been nurturing the conversations with my two young boys, you know, on kind of what they're thinking, what they want to do. And I'm not a big college person. I don't believe that everybody should go to college. I don't think everybody needs to go in debt. And if you're not looking to do these certain things, you know, I, I just don't believe in that. But I do believe that my children need to be kind, productive human beings in society. And I would love for them to possibly do some military service for the benefits, the VA loan that we have. I mean, just that alone, right? Just your VA. That's worth it. Just just that alone. Yeah. And um, medical for me, I didn't have, I grew up fairly poor. So I mean, I didn't have medical, I didn't have dental, I didn't really have anything, you know? Um, 
But I, I definitely, not coach them, but I definitely am planting the seeds. Hey, if you even did this for a few years, you know, uh, for your commitment, you would gain so much from it. And then you can always start after that. You could do a whole, I mean, I feel like my military service was one chapter of life and then my contracting is you know another chapter of life yeah. and now i'm living my entrepreneurial life i mean if we're blessed enough you have time to get a few different chapters in you Holy. know that's not gonna hurt two to four years of service is not gonna hurt anything not you know all. so yeah i talk to people all the time you know when i'm consulting them on mortgages and everything else about the length of time they're going to be in service mm -hmm. as it relates to like their real estate portfolio and growing wealth and like trying to broaden that thought process because like for somebody who is contemplating like a full career in the military, by the time that they're done with that 20 years, assuming most get in when they're 18, yeah. you're in your early 40s. Yeah. You're, not, you're not old. The one thing I dropped the ball on, I'll tell you, I, I wish once I got out, somebody would have given me guidance or directive. And maybe somebody did and I didn't listen. I don't know. But to, to my from today, I'm always like, why didn't anybody tell me to do this? To stay in the reserve or the guard. Yeah. You know, to stay and keep your foot in the door, you know. Then even no matter what happens, COVID, all this stuff, you could always have this fallback. You know what I mean? If you ever wanted to have a fallback in life and like this, oh, well, I could re-up and I could go active again or what have you, you always have that. Yeah. Not to mention you always have a built-in family because, I mean, totally. one of the reasons why I even said yes to this, honestly, because of your background, you know. You're military. I'm military. We say yes to each other, right? Yeah. Like it's an instant family. And I love that. I love no matter where I am talking or go or networking or what have you, if you have military service under your belt, there's an instant change in the, sh in the handshake. Would totally. you not agree? 100%. Yeah. Like I have your back. You have mine no matter what just because of that. Right. And that's uh, a yeah. – I always tell people too like one of the things I experienced being in the military that – um, which is an interesting like feeling that I had is like, you know, you go to a different base and you're in a new town, a new mm -hmm. state, like you don't know anybody, you don't know directions, you don't know how to get to and from places. But I always felt like, and I don't know if you felt the same way, but once I got through the, the, the base gate, yeah, I felt safe. Yeah. Like I felt like I was, I felt like, a, a, oh, I'm at home. Yeah. I'm okay. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. outside the gate, I don't know what was out there. Yeah. You know, probably nothing. But, right. But you know, I know what, what you're saying. But like I got inside those gates and I'm like, okay, I feel comfortable. I feel okay. I feel safe. I yeah. always remember that feeling yeah. all the time. Well, look at it even from like a psychological standpoint of wearing the same uniform, you know, and just having like these guidelines, these rules and order and things like that. And most bases are like little cities, you know. So yeah. I, I get exactly what you're saying. And that's one thing that I feel like helps make me and my real estate team successful um, because that military, you know, somebody's getting orders and coming from one base to let's say Creech Air Force Base here in Las Vegas or Nellis mm -hmm. Air Force Base here in Las Vegas, and hey, I'm going to be getting orders to Creech, you know, do you have a lender, do you have a realtor in Las Vegas, and who are they going to ask? They're going to ask all their military friends, yeah. and then their military friends are going to plug that, and it's funny because it trickles down. Not only are they looking for all of these suggestions, which we're going to take, right? I'm going to take my military friend's suggestions of that, but it comes down to who's your hairstylist? Where do you go for nails? Where do you take your kids to school? You know, all of these things, and it, you kind of plug and play. You go from one base to the next. Yeah. You ask these questions, and you're kind of handed this handbook by your family, right? Right. And it's like, here you go. Because they know you're not going to steer them wrong. It. Yeah. Because they have your back. Yeah. You know? 100%. So, um, that's, that's been really good for me and my business specifically just because of that, because I do get to put Air Force veteran next to my name, proudly serving those who serve. They already know that I'm not just going to, you know, assist them with their real estate needs and real estate investing needs, but that there's that safety. Like, I yeah. feel safe with her already because I already know that she wore the uniform. She knows what I'm talking about when I say TDYs or PCSs or what have you. Like, right. I already speak the language. Yeah, it's not you know? foreign. Yeah. yeah, it's not foreign. So. Yeah, you don't have to learn the phonetic alphabet to, yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. that sounds so can. But yeah. Um, but, yeah, you understand all the acronyms and how to deal with them and stuff, and there's that that instant credibility, that instant trust. Mm -hmm. um, and it helps break down barriers quick. Oh, for sure. Very quick. And I am, you know, one thing that I have, because now I'm out, right? And so, and my husband's a fire captain for Clark County and we have kids, we're here, we're rooted. Mm -hmm. But I have so much uh, sympathy for the phone call. When I get the phone call of, hey, we just got orders to Virginia. We just got orders to DC. We just got orders to Puerto Rico, you know, what have you. Because more often than not, I feel like I just got them into that house. And sometimes it's two years, sometimes it's four years, but it always feels like it was yesterday. Yeah, and I'm like, sure. ah, 
okay, there's, but there's this true sense of, it's not like, ooh, I'm getting a listing. It's like, ah, okay, how you feel about that? Like how are part the kids of the family's doing? leaving, yeah. Yeah, and how are the kids doing? You know, I'm talking to the wife, oh, I can't even believe this. I thought we were going to stay here because we all know you get told one thing and then tt bait and switch. Yep. But you're talking to these families, this husband and wife, husband, husband, wife, wife, whatever, with three, four kids, and they're uprooting themselves every two years, every four years, and going and doing again. And I don't think people truly understand, like, how hard that is. It's hard as a it's kid. It's freaking hard. And it's hard as the parent feeling like, oh, they just had their best friend Johnny lives down the street. They've been growing up with them for four years now, and it's like... Let's go meet a new Johnny on the other side of the United States. I mean, the the children and the family that have to do that over. I just have so much empathy, I guess, for them and heart for them doing yeah, that. It's. I mean, I th- I think it's hardest on the kids. Like I, when I was a kid, I only changed schools like once. But it's hard being the new kid. Yeah. Right. The intimidation, the fear. You don't yeah. have friends, like all the stuff. But they're doing that over multiple, and over multiple times. and over again. So they have no continuity. A lot of because they're parent has chosen to serve which is amazing and i hope that they the kids get the perspective of like that's awesome you know yeah but it's it's hard trust me i'm talking to the family all the time and and one kid may be okay and they're like but this kid is not doing good you know and it's it's just tough so when you when you say like when you look at somebody and you say thank you for your service thank you for your sacrifice just know that it's not always just the service member that you're saying that to you're saying that to the entire unit the whole family unit because they're sacrificing as well, right? Oh, they are. So yeah, and it's crazy. Like when you see like those those images, like either videos or pictures. Oh, of, coming like, back home. The coming oh. back home, and you know the, the little kid like runs to jump and give you know. Their, and they're their daddy like a hug. sobbing. They're five years old and they're sobbing. Yeah. You know, like yeah, it's just heart wrenching. Yeah, and you miss you know as the parent like you miss those times. Yeah. Right. And oh. those are those are precious times. Like you don't get those back when you're you don't when your baby's a baby, right? You don't or get they're those back. three or four years old, like. Yeah. You know, eventually they grow up and they don't need mommy and daddy as much. Yeah. And so those times when they really, really like you and really love you and really need you, you miss on so much of that. Oh, my God, and dude. So that, that, so you're just like you're sparking a story, if you don't mind me sharing. Yeah. When I was deployed, I was working out. And again, when I was deployed, it was um, in Iraq. It was around 06. And uh, it just it, women, the number of women in the military has obviously increased, but we're still a, a small minority. Yeah. And back then, you know, it, I was a very, very small minority. It was hard to even work out on base, not to any, not calling out anybody, but it was like a fishbowl effect. You walk into the freaking gym and I'm you're sure. like, it just like, it just doesn't feel good, you know? Yeah. I wouldn't do squats. Let's just say that. Yeah. There's a lot of things that I would not be doing just because I'm like, this just almost feels not safe sometimes, you know? Yeah. <laughs> not to anybody. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? There's 50 dudes in there working out, and yeah. here's and two girls. 50, and yeah, and so that means 100 eyeballs, and we're like, it just doesn't feel good. So anyways, I was working out on this leg machine, and there was a woman sitting next to me, a woman. So I'm like, hey, <laughs> somebody to talk to, right? Yeah. And I'm just kind of like, I was Air Force, uh, she was Army, and so we're just kind of bullshitting back and forth, and and she had just gotten back home from leave. And I'm like, oh, what what did you do? Because she was there, then she had leave, and she came home. And I think it was like two weeks. Um, she's like, I got to go back for my baby's um, one-year birthday. And I was like, what? And so I needed her to break that down for me. In the Air Force at that time, and I don't know. I've been out for a minute, right? Mm-hmm. But like the rotations were like four to six months Air Force, Army, Marines. There's more often than not, they're doing 12-month rotations, yeah. you know? And so... <laughs> She said that, and I said, what? And she was like, oh, yeah, I, I deployed, like, and it was just this small amount of time after having her baby. She was like, I was still, you know, yeah. breastfeeding and, you know, all this stuff. And so she got to go home for the babies. So she had a baby. She had to leave the baby. She got to go home for the baby's one-year birthday. And they shipped, shipped her ass back. And that's a whole other conversation, right? Because everybody's going to have a ton of opinions. Right. You know, you, you signed up. That's what you do, et cetera, et cetera. All I'm saying is for just a quick second, like I just had, again, so much like I was in shock and awe of something like that because what you just said, you're never going to get that year back. You're never going to get that year back with your baby, you know? Mm -hmm. So. On that bonding time is so important when, especially at that age with mom. Mom. Yeah. When she was still literally like nursing. nursing. Yeah. That's really, really tough. It's tough. 
It is tough and reciprocal. I'm not taking that away from the fathers. You know, again, when I was in, they didn't have paternity. Mm -hmm. That wasn't even a thing. No. That wasn't even a thing. And so now I'm seeing the uh, male partner being granted, you know, weeks, six, eight weeks even. I'm like, that is amazing because they they didn't even care. You know, you had a baby and you were back to work. The mom could take care of it, you know. So, um, so I'm glad that we're, I, I'm glad that we're growing a little bit on that aspect, but, um, yeah, man, those sacrifices run deep for sure. And some things that you'll never get back. Yeah. Yeah. They run really deep. Um, so that, that thank you for serving is like really the families. I mean, the, it's the hard nucleus. on the member, but yeah. yeah, the nucleus is really what, what yeah. takes it. And, um, I, someone, I was talking to somebody and they likened it to like your family is just luggage. Ah, it's so true. You know, you just. I'm going Calling here, around. you're coming with me. Yeah. You don't really have a choice, do you? Nope. That's so true. Yeah. That's so true. It's kind of a sad perspective, but that's the reality, it right? Is. And it that's, is. And that's that's our military. And what the family also signed up for, and there's, you know, normally that it's a, okay, this is what we're doing, normally, you normally, know? yeah. But um, there's definitely different emotions with that, too, so. Yeah. And it's not all bad. Like, I mean, for the people right. watching it, it's like, it's not all this sa- no. sob story. Like, there's the, the flip side of that, too, which is really great, and there's amazing um, bonds and friendships oh, and life. careers yeah. and lives that get sparked out of all this service as well. So it's not always like no. heartache. No. Um, but there's a We're lot of really cool stuff. We're going to the stuff. deeper level that maybe yeah. some people just didn't have the perspective like we keep talking about to sure. um, experience. That's yeah. all. Yeah. So tell us a little bit now. You, you've you gone, you're in your entrepreneurial chapter yeah. of life now. Um, and you run a real estate team. You're mm-hmm. a real estate investor. Mm-hmm. You're speaking. I got to see you at WealthCon. Yeah. Talk on stage, which yeah. was awesome. You're really coming to San Diego next. Yes. Um, so tell us a little bit about this chapter and yeah. what's going on. Because I think this is inspiring for I, I, a lot of, I think a lot of our, our military now, especially with access to like social media and YouTube and stuff like that, mm-hmm. they see, you know, videos on people talking about, investing in real estate or flipping houses mm-hmm. and doing all this stuff. And like, it's exciting, yeah. right? And like, okay, I'm going to get out and I'm going to go do that. Yeah. And I'm going to be a real estate agent. I'm going to do all these things. So tell us a little bit about like your story here in this entrepreneurial phase. Okay. So I um, left my contracting job up at Creech Air Force Base, flying drone aircraft, MQ-1, MQ-9 aircraft, and teaching the military how to launch, land, employ weapons, really fun stuff, mm-hmm. right? And honestly, my husband and I started buying in 08. So we started buying in 08, 09 with all the money that we had, which was nothing. Right. We bought a house. And it was a, a person that I worked with. They sold their house for like $75,000. They short sold. It was the short sell craze, right? Yep. So everybody and their mother was telling me not to buy real estate. Real estate was bad. Look at what the market did. Wait for it to crash lower. Again, perspective, perspective, perspective. Because now I get to sit back and I'm like, dude, I had a $75,000 house. The mortgage was $500. And Ugh. I was renting it out for 1000 you know? But every, everybody back then was telling me no. Right. Just like everybody told me not to buy in 2017, 18, 19, 2020, 2021, 2022. I mean, I've been told not to buy in every single market yeah. at this point, right? What I learn is every market's different and the benefits of the market become different. And whether it's cash flow or appreciation, just a tangible asset in general, there's always a benefit to real estate. Just That's a different the strategy thing. to it. Yeah. It's, it, and so I've lived through, I've lived through all of them, you know, from the short sell phase to now. And I'm picking up some stuff sub two and I'm doing midterm rentals. And I'm, it's just this constant evolution of this fun, cool thing. Anyways, um, I, At one time, I was making really good money, and my husband and I had, I think, five or six homes under our belt at that point, which is always already a nice little portfolio. Yeah. And we're planners, so we were, like, you know, getting our bed ready one night, and I just kind of was like, maybe I should go get my real estate license because, God forbid, you were to pass away because this is how I talk, you know, Mm -hmm. and I needed to liquidate some assets to pay off this home. I'm just a planner. I'm like, having my license would be super beneficial, I think I'm just going to do that this year, you know, and I put a timeline on myself and I'm like, I'm just going to go get my license. And, and I actually said this and I'm like, and who knows, babe, maybe I can like close two deals a year. If I close two deals a year, that could be an extra $12,000 in our savings account. These were my numbers, right? It wasn't yeah. this, it wasn't this like aha epiphany moment. It was just like, I'm going to be a millionaire. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like, I'm just going to do this because it felt like the, the next sequential common sense step to take. So I had this career going. And after my flights up at Creech, I'd start, like, studying for my real estate exam. 
And while I was studying for my real estate exam, and I'm going to piggyback on everything that we said for the first half of this podcast, um, a, a chair would come and like swivel in front of me. And they'd be like, hey, I want to sell my house. And I'm like, cool. I'm studying for a real estate license. You know this. Like, why are you asking me? You know? And they're like, because when can you do that? And I'm like, dude, I don't have a license. And they're like, yeah, don't care. What I realized pretty quickly, because that happened multiple times within the span of about a month and a half. Oh, wow. Yeah. Was people trusted me and my name and what I had built for myself as an instructor and somebody that was reputable and trustworthy and, you know, all this stuff. And what I learned was people want to trust people. You know, mm -hmm. and it wasn't necessarily the experience that I ne needed. They weren't looking for 30 year old 80s style real realtor <laughs> photos. You know what I mean? Like yes. I got to fix my hair. Um, that's not what they were looking for. They were looking for somebody to trust. And so before I ever had my real estate license, I had seven deals that I had to plug underneath my broker. Wow. Because people wanted to buy and sell with me before I could even solidify my license, which I think I got it within a month and a half. I mean, I got it really, really quick. It's pretty fast. But huh? I had to, and I went, oh, you know, I was like, oh my God, like this could be something. And it got my brain spinning on that where I was like, dang, I don't really know a realtor in town that's like plugging themselves a VA specialist or like, you know, my, my niche proudly serving those who serve. Like I didn't see anybody doing that. If you ask somebody uh, on base, I wasn't getting one name over and over again. Yeah. I was getting all these names and I'm like, man, this can be something. This could be something. So then I went and I asked to go part-time at my contracting job to kind of pull back to give myself a little more time to do real estate just to kind of see again. I'm not, I didn't want to totally like cut our legs out from underneath us. I've always been the breadwinner in my family. And that's a whole other topic that people feel like is a weird topic. My husband is a fire captain. He makes good money. He's yeah, my he hero. He's yeah. my man. I've always made more money, period. We are okay with that. <laughs> So I didn't want to walk away from this career that was really like the m where most of our money was coming from if I couldn't substantiate it with this new career, you know. It didn't take long for me to go part-time and go, this is something. This is something that I can do. And I'm missing out on my kids' lives, and I'm handing them over to babysitters every day, and I'm launching planes at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'm getting home at 6, and he's a fire captain, so he's gone – you know, 24-hour shifts. So I'm kind of like a single mom half the month. So at some point, every entrepreneur out there has to jump. I don't right. know. Sometimes people decide to, like, jump and, like, build the parachute on the way down. Sometimes people, like, check their parachute but still jump scared. Everybody – but there's some point where you have to just jump. Yeah. And every single person that you talk to that's uber successful has that freaking point. And so mine was that. Mine was I wanted more freedoms. I wanted – and I, and I trusted myself. I knew that. And I still feel like this today. I always tell people, I'm eating my hair, sorry. I always tell people, take everything away from me. Take everything away from me. Take my home, take my wealth, take my car, take my jewelry, take my stuff, take my real estate, take it all away from me. I'll come back. I, I believe that much in myself, as should everybody, you know? Right. So... I ended up walking away, and the day that I drove, because I'm also religious, I may have a potty mouth, but I'm also religious, <laughs> and I do believe in God, and I'm a Christian woman, I was driving that 30-minute drive from Creech Air Force Base back to the Northwest, which anybody who's done that drive knows what I'm talking about. It's just in the middle of freaking nowhere. And I'm nervous, for sure, that I'm walking away from back then. I think I was making like $136,000, which back then was a lot of money. That's a lot, Still yeah. a lot of money mm -hmm. now. So... I'm driving away, at, or at, that was my last day doing something I've been doing for 13 years, and I'm just like feeling it, like, oh man, I really hope that I just made the right decision. Yeah. My phone rang three times with leads in a 30 minute period on the way home, and I went, all right, I hear you, I'm good. Yeah. That's what that's what he's telling me. God had a right? plan. Yeah. My phone's ringing. My phone rang. I, by the time I got home, I had no more fear. That was him just going, chill, you good? Yeah. You know. And since then, it's just been. I've I've just can't even believe where I'm at right now. I just can't even believe. I mean, I, I grew up in a trailer park. I grew up not even in a trailer park. Before a trailer park, I grew up in a travel trailer parked on the sides of people's houses. I didn't even have a house to live in. I had hand-me-downs. I would cycle my clothing by the day to make sure that, you know, the shirt that I wore three days ago, they didn't realize I didn't wear it back to back. And so to be where I'm at now and to make the income that I make and to travel with my family, 
with no restriction and to have the portfolio that we have, which may not be 100 homes, but it's, it's 22 houses, it's 41 doors. It's a nice portfolio. I'm not really looking for that 100-door portfolio. I'm looking for quality now, not quantity. But just to be able to do that, I was, I was hugging my husband this morning. I was hugging my husband this morning because he had a horrible call last night. He had a horrible call last night. And I was just telling him, I love you. We're so blessed. Our kids are healthy. I'm healthy. Look at what we can do. I mean, it's just, it's just unbelievable. But there definitely was that moment of jump. Like you had right. to jump. You had to bet on yourself. You had to feel uncomfortable and just do it, you know, and grind. And it's not all easy, you know. Right. Um, it's a lot of work. But I'm at the point now where I feel like my snowball is just, it's just like every it's year, it just, it just is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I think the hardest part is getting the snowball up the mountain, like I always say. Then you you push it over, and there's that point where, you know, it really does kind of start just, just to become its own beast. Yeah, you know? I would agree with you. So I'm with you a ton. So and now you're you're actually like speaking. Like I saw you, I got to see you I speak love on speaking. stage. How did that come to be? Did people just reach out to you and say, "Hey, come talk about this"? Or no, how'd that happen? I'm putting myself out there. Okay. I love it. I in my 30s, so I just turned 40. And I'm super excited. I keep telling people for this decade. So 40 to 50, I think, is probably going to be the best 10 years of my life. I really, truly believe this decade is going to be the best 10 years of my life. Now, come talk to me when I turn 50. I'll be like, damn, I can't <laughs> believe that I'm 50. Yeah. My 30s, from 30 to 39, I felt like I really just uh, did a lot of growth and like learning who I was. So I enjoyed my 30s. But what I found in my 30s somewhere along the way is not only do I really love speaking, I'm good at it. It's okay to say these things. Yeah. To find these things that you're good at and be like, I'm kind of fucking good at that. You know? I'm good at it. I love it. I'm passionate. I know how to connect with people. I know when they're head nodding, you know, they're getting it. Or when they're blank stares, okay, divert, I need to do something different. So I enjoy it. And I thought, you know what? I'm supposed to do this. Because again, not, you know, like tooting my own horn, but standing in some of these conferences and you watch some speakers and you're like, Meh. you know, like right. didn't really do it for me, you know? Yeah. Um, and I'm sitting in the audience at so many of these events and I'm sorry, I tell Ryan this all the time, Ryan Pineda, I'm like, you don't have enough boobs on stage. You need some more, you know, <laughs> like you got a lot of men up there and that's yeah. cool. But there's this whole other dynamic that I feel like men and women have a beautiful balance. And so I, I, am, I am not a she-ra, all female, all the time. I feel like there is a need and necessity and a place for men every single day, you know? So I get that. But when I go and I only see men, from a man's perspective, I hope they also realize, hey, there may be something missing. Women bring different things to the table that men cannot bring. Right. And men bring different things to the table that I cannot bring. Mm -hmm. And there's this balance and beauty, and if we can – agree on that we can be better for it yeah. you know what i mean and so i go to so many of these events and i'm like man they just need a woman speaker they really need a woman speaker they need a different perspective i think that should be the topic of like this entire podcast yeah, right absolutely we just need a different perspective and i sit there and i'm just like uh, uh, you know so i just started throwing it out there hey i want to do public speaking hey i want to do public speaking hey i want to do and then i get on these stages and it's a small stage to a big stage to these other moments and i meet more and more people i met you in Hollywood, I'll be speaking at WealthCon at Caesars Palace in April. I'm going to San Diego to speak and all these things. And I don't know where God has, what he has in store for me for this, but I do feel like it's big. And so I'm just going to keep raising my hand and I'm just going to keep saying, hey, my name's Felicia Rexford. I would like to do any kind of public speaking that you have out there if it has anything to do with entrepreneurship or um, real estate related or anything along short-term rentals, long-term rentals, whatever you want, you know. I think I definitely have something that I can bring to the table. So I'm just going to keep putting myself out there. But that's how it started. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to, to, like, be at those conferences because as a man, you do hear – you just hear it different, right? And mm -hmm. I've always there, – there's just a different presence that a woman brings. And I think – even professionally too, like I've always said, like as I've been in mortgage companies and trained loan officers and recruited and stuff, like um, I've always said the women are better salespeople yeah. because they can connect mm -hmm. better than mm -hmm. the men can. There just happens to be more men in, in numbers mm -hmm. usually in a lot of these different career fields than there are women. But I feel like the women have a greater opportunity because they're better connectors. Yeah, I, I can agree with that to a certain extent for sure. There's even some men on my team, they're just rough around the edges. Yeah. How the text messages come through to the client, I'm like, ooh. 
you know? Like, yeah. I'm like, uh, a little softer, man, you know? Um, we just communicate diff- differently. We do things differently. Like I said, everybody has their strengths and weaknesses, but I definitely feel like there's always a deficit, whether it's a wealth con event or whatever. There's all the, always these deficits. There's, there's a few strong female speakers, but the other issue is it's on us too. And for some reason, I'm not exactly sure why, you know, the women really aren't leaning into that power either or they're not pulling up a chair at the table or whatever the case may be, where I've just never had a problem doing that because yeah. I feel like I have something to, to give. Mm-hmm. You know, I have a lot to learn too. And I think, um, again, my 30s helped me understand somewhere along the lines, us all as teenagers, 20-year-olds, this, that, the other, you don't know everything. Right. Okay? So, but in my 30s, I really, really, really leaned into that. And I was just, I, I'm going to consistently be a student of this game called life, but I'm, I also have something to bring. And there's this strength and there's this God-given gift that we're supposed to be using. Right. And I don't want to die not having tried using it on the biggest stages out there. Yeah. You know? So. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so how are, you, how are you using this as like a tool for your children? Oh, that's a great question because I have, even though I'm, I'm this, I'm, you know, at the soccer games, I'm the loudest woman on the side. I would expect that. I'm the screamer. (laughs) I'm the, you know, I really lean on my Mexican side of my heritage for that. (laughs) So I'm the loud Mexican mom, you know, and um, my kids know that, but it's funny because you have children, they come out of your body and you think they're just going to be, you know, what you train them to be. And that couldn't be any further from the truth. They come out imprinted as their own human, and then you have to like, whoa, you know? So I have a shyer son, and I bring him to these events, and if anything, I just am trying to nurture him to have confidence where he should have confidence. He doesn't have to be on a stage speaking like mommy, but you can if you want to, you know? Right. And right now, it's a lot about not worrying about what other people think. That if I could strip that of, if I could strip everybody of that, how much more freeing would that be? It's so much more freeing. They just had their first dance, my kids. And I'm like, let me tell you something that I wish I knew before. Go to the dance and freaking dance. If a song comes on that you like, dance. As soon as you start having these thoughts of like, I don't know how to dance or what are, what are people going to think of me and all that, that gets highlighted and just throughout our whole adult life. It does. And it compounds. It gets builds. worse and worse and worse. If we can learn and if I can just teach my children that, like to shred that, not caring all the time what people think, it will be such a freeing way of living. And, and the way that you think of everything changes, you know? And the funny part is, let's talk about that dance scenario. I'm driving, I'm saying this whole spiel that I'm telling you guys right now. Like, let's just, th- let's say that we could tap into the brain of the person standing on the sidelines while you're dancing. And for a second, you're worrying about like what they think of you. They're probably thinking, dang, I wish I had guts like that and could go dance. Like exactly what they're thinking. They look like they're having a lot of fun, but I can't do that. That's probably what they're thinking. They're not necessarily thinking, God, they can't dance. And if they are, who cares? Because I really don't care what that person thinks. Yeah, how's it going to impact you anyways? Right? Yeah. Like, it's just an – so those are the kind of things that I'm trying to just get through their heads at a younger age than I ever had. Because, again, I think all of that really blossomed for me in my 30s. Yeah. Well, in those, in those moments, too, they're momentary, Ugh. right? So, like, even if the kid not dancing is looking at you thinking some sort of way, two days from now, they don't even remember it. It's gone. It's yeah. not even in their brain yeah. anymore. So all the worry that you built yourself up to have and prevent yourself from having a good time or going out on a limb or whatever it is was all for nothing. And it's for the person that you probably shouldn't even be magnetized to. Like, that person probably isn't your bro. You know what I mean? Because yeah. your bro's going to be, woo, you know, and with their little flashlights on. And those cheerleaders are the people that you need to seek out in life. So the naysayers, why do they even care about the dance? Right. You know what I mean? They're not adding gasoline to my fire. They're trying to, like, put it out with an extinguisher. And I don't need those people around me. Like, again, just uh, just these limiting, like, thoughts, you know, that we do to ourselves. So. That's what I'm trying to teach my children. I, I understand that I have different boys, you know, but I just want them to see mommy on stage. I want them to see how to work on their communication skills. I want them to see that when I speak, it's really, I don't like to be 
hoity-toity. Uh, you have to like label off the accolades because people want to know who they're listening to. Yeah. And that's always the most boring part for me. The, the part that I get really excited about is when I really let myself be vulnerable and I start to can be really passionate about something and mm -hmm. I see somebody in the audience be like, oh, what she just said. And when that happens, I'm like, I connected with that person. That's what it's about, right. you know? And I want them to see that. And I tell them that that's their superpower. That's my superpower. I feel like I have a superpower with being able to connect with people. And I want their superpower to be that as well, however they need it to be, whether that's on a smaller level and just realizing that you have the ability to change somebody's trajectory in terms of how they feel about themselves. Right. Like these are superpowers, you know, um, and I just want them to have the confidence to go out there and, and do that and without the limitation of worrying about what other people think and to be kind along the way and to be human and to have a heart, you know, so – that's that's what I'm trying to work on. And it's not about the college degree in my house. It's yeah. about those concepts. Those are super important. And all of that stuff, like, it's all life stuff, right? Yes. You're not going to learn that in a formal education sense. Right. Anywhere. But it's all that life stuff that's intrinsic that will carry them and propel them forward. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Yeah. I know my kids are my kids are young, so we're not quite at that stage. My oldest is seven. So, you know, doing the reports in front of a class and just working on the speaking part and looking at the audience mm -hmm. and, you know, like those little things, like, you know, that's kind of the communication yeah. set that we're at, right. That's relative to that right now. But, um, same thing because I was worried about, well, what are they going to think if I do this? That you don't have to worry about that. Nope. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You're going to do great. Yeah. You know, like, and just encouraging that. And now she gets up there in front of her little second grade class and she knocks them dead. Yeah, right? I love it. She does great and I love it. looks at everybody and then looks at her notes and, you know, and yeah. it's awesome, yeah. right? It's cool to see that that transition and that transformation. Yep, I love it. I used to tell my boys, we have a big dining room table and they'd have to practice their speech. I'm like, go stand on the table. And they're like, what? And I'm like, go stand on the table. And I would dim the lights and make it like their stage, you know, and kind of be <laughs> down in the audience and listening to them. And there's just something powerful about that. Like they talk about, you know, the power poses and things like that and feeling confident, you know. And yeah. Um, it's, it is, it's a really, it's a, it's something that we're lacking that, um, communication skills and we're getting worse at it. We're getting worse at it right now with the texting well. and the shorthand and the being behind the screens and the not being personable. And how often do people throw a camera on themselves and put two people in a room and go hold a conversation? Right. This well, is a talent almost now. It you is. Know? It is. And, <laughs> and I want to ask you this, but I, I see that like in my business, right? With, with clients because. Yeah. And even sometimes with with peers, you know, real estate agents, like they want to text the world. Yeah. And maybe I'm old school, but I want to have the conversation. Yep. I want to talk about it, and I'm I'm okay with like both. yes, no, a little bit like of both. Yeah. Uh, short stuff on yeah. text, totally fine with yeah. that. But sometimes, and I don't the know how novel. the novel. I'm just like, if you got time to write that much or yeah. ask me these many questions in a text, then you got time for me to talk to you because, yeah. like, sometimes I'll get I'll get questions, and there's so many of them, like. It's going to take me 30 minutes, to 10 put times this longer yes. to type this than it will be just to call you and just talk about this. Yes. Right. And I, I don't know how you, you see that in your, but I always, I'm trying to like have a balance because I respect that's how some people want to communicate to a degree, but there's, yeah. there's a balance where it's like, okay, like it's a complete waste of my time to text the answer. Yes. Yeah. You know? And I agree. And I think I just, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like that forceful person where I'm like, hey, just thought it'd be easier to call, you know, <laughs> like. I'm going to make you do this, even if you didn't want to, but here it goes. And yeah. we'll be done in 10 minutes. It'll be like ripping off a Band-Aid, you right. know? But, yeah, I was actually I, – I, um, I checked into David Green on Bigger Pockets. I checked into one of his lives that he was doing one time, and this guy had asked a question, but the question was all, like, shorthand, almost looked like child text. I don't know, ways that, you know, the thanks, the TYs, the this, but it was all like that. And he goes, David Green, I just, I felt like I went to church and I was like driving and I'm like, preach, preach. And he was just <laughs> like, first of all, if we're going to talk business, can we please like ask a question and not short text form? Like, let's act like adults asking an adult question, you know? And like, he, I love it. he never answered the question. He went on this huge rant, you know, and I'm just <laughs> driving. I just felt like I was at church because. There's just so much of that. There's just so much of a lack of communication and being personable and personal. And, um, man, 
I, I also think as the gap widens, there's also more opportunity, which is super interesting. I keep call I keep telling people it's the two L's, laziness and being limitless. And so as everybody's becoming more lazy in society, the people that have a limitless mindset, the gap is widening. You know what I mean? Like when cool. I first started this entrepreneurial phase, and I'm such a I'm such a visual person. So whenever I tell this story, I, I truly think of myself on like my high school track, you know, like running in circles. And I'm like, when I first started this entrepreneurial um, game, I felt like I just was like always neck and neck with everybody. Like everybody's here and you're just going and, and it's just this tight race because you got so many people that are hard chargers and working and da da da. And then boom, COVID hit, which was kind of like a trip in the race. Yeah. And you still had some runners, but a lot of people were like, oh, Oh, I can get hand me outs and I, hand me outs and I'm gonna just stay at home and gain money and now I don't even want to go back to work anymore and just like everybody just fell into like this laziness and for the people that had it in their spirit to keep running, I felt like that was just like this boom, this like I don't know, like I gained, I gained this huge gap, but the laziness, I mean, the people aren't even running anymore; they're like sitting on the sidelines. Yeah, and if you have this limitless mindset of like keep fucking running you know it's just the gap is getting bigger and bigger so i feel like this is happening again in my best decade you know yeah. and so i'm like there is so much meat and so much like room for winning right now it's crazy well i see it i see that even more so now just post covid like in the lending world mm. because so many people had it easy and you know business was falling from the sky and then, then business was really hard to get yep. over like the last year. Yep. And I've I've seen the same thing and get and get feedback from other people like they're 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 dropping like flies. Yep. Like out of the business, going to get a job, doing something else. Mm -hmm. And like there's so much opportunity now, mm -hmm. like in the lending space, to grab market share because there's so many people that did not keep that run going. That's the biggest. That's the biggest word I've been using within my team over and over again is market share. We're capturing this market share. We're capturing this market share because what you just said, everybody's dropping out. Mm -hmm. I would like to know, though, really fast. Yeah. I mean, you stuck it out. 2023 was brutal for, in, from my perspective, lenders, home inspectors, um, escrow officers. You know, it was hard for a lot of people when you're a realtor and have a real estate team like myself. We've got, we have buyers and sellers. So I've got, I've got two. We're lending, you're primarily, obviously, buyers. Right. So 2023, with the interest rates spiking, was tough. Mm -hmm. You stuck it out. Yep. And here you are, as everybody else is walking away, how do you feel about 2024? Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, this month has been on fire. I mean, as I was coming in, my, my assistant texted me, hey, we got four new applications last night. That's awesome. You know, and it's a Wednesday. In, right. In January, right? Right. It, in January, traditionally, is a slower mm -hmm. month, mm -hmm. and we're busy. We're Good. super busy. For the spring. For the spring. For, the, for our spring, summer months, which are traditionally hot. See, I, and I started to see it even in December. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you did too, yeah, but I started, started to feel it up. in December, and I was like, damn, this is not a boring December. And it's interesting because people will be watching this podcast, but you and I are both the pulse of the market. We mm -hmm. are going to feel it before the statistics come out, before the numbers come out. Well, yeah, 100%. You know, so like, and that's, isn't it funny? Like, I'm sure you're texting your lending friends and stuff like that, and, and, and me and my team are talking, and we're like, ew, this is crazy, because we just know it's happening before anybody else. I think 2024 is going to be insanely epic for buying and selling, for I both agree. buyers I feel and like, sellers. It's like right now it's kind of the calm before the storm, so yeah. to speak, where, um, where we feel, like you're just saying, like we are the pulse, so we're feeling things pick up, and they're getting busier. But I feel like the masses no, don't they know haven't that. caught on yet. No. And when they catch on, it's going to be like a tsunami. And almost too late. 2020, 2021, 10, 12, yes. 15 offers. I already am seeing that on the East Coast, Virginia, D.C. area. Yep. I have friends trying to buy. They're putting in offers, $100,000, $110,000 above list, multiple offers. Happening heavy in Virginia it's, right now. It's crazy. It's yeah. crazy. And, and for Vegas, you know, we're a bottleneck. We don't have enough inventory. And we have a lack of inventory nationwide, really. But yes, here in Vegas, we're, it's like this tight bottleneck that's happening. So I think 2024 is going to be a, an amazing year for people that have either been waiting for those interest rates to go down, yes, but – now you have to be prepared for more competition. 
right? You yeah. waited. Okay, cool. So I hope you get the rate that you wanted. But because you waited, now home prices are going to go up because it's the basic economic problem of supply and demand, right? Yep. And we don't have the supply, but the demand is going up. Therefore, home prices are going to go up. Yep, so I'm yeah. happy for you getting your interest rate, but you may be paying a heftier price up front, right? And they will, right? Yeah. I mean, if, if you even if you just do the math, which I show people like in my, my pre-approval consultation, I show them the math yeah. of what the actual dollars are to wait. Here's what's going to cost you to wait dollars three months. Dollars to wait. I love it. Here's what's going to cost you to wait six months, right? Because not only do you have appreciation, but you have amortization. So the loan's yes. getting paid down. Yes. Yeah, if it was only six months, it's not getting paid down a lot. Yes. But it did get paid down a There's little. There's a gap. There's a gap. And that gap grows every single month to the point where now if you wait for the – and Warren Buffett says it the best, right? You can never time the bottom of a market, right. which we're not necessarily timing a bottom. But if you're trying to time, like, rates for the yeah. right time to, like, stick your foot in the real estate game – you're you're gonna you're gonna mess it up, right? Because you're gonna wait till the wrong time, and yes, that rate might magically be there for you, but now so are forty other buyers on the house you fell in love with. Yeah, and and ten of those buyers got no problem put a hundred grand over ask. Right, and you don't have the hundred grand. Right, and now what? Right, especially in our field. I mean, you're the VA loan guy. I'm proudly serving those who serve. We're trying to help our VA. A lot of times we get we get the stigma. That we do, that we aren't super liquid. That our buyers don't maybe don't have a lot of money in the bank account, which that's not always true, yeah. right? But there's that stigma there, and there are those first time home buyers <coughs> trying to use their VA loan that sometimes aren't super liquid. Well, if you're if you come to this game, this big boy table now without any um, assets in the bank, you know it may hurt. It, and it yeah. may actually make you uneligible, you know. Yeah. You better do it now. To perform. That's what I would that's Don't what I wanted to summertime. say. That's what I wanted to say. So it's not that twenty twenty four it's it's all behind them. The first quarter twenty twenty four is where people need to be making their biggest plays. If you're looking to buy, sell, um, upgrade housing, you know, buy your first investment, like first quarter, which oh yeah, January's almost gone. It's it's honestly now. Spring, yep. summer is probably not gonna be your best time. It's gonna be too late. Yeah. If you look back like if people talk about like, oh, those people who bought a house in 2020 were so smart, right? Look they at them now. They were being called idiots. Look at them now. Yeah, they were being oh called gosh. fools then. Yes. And yeah. But I'm like, if you wait too late this year, mm -hmm. or, or, or actually, if, if you buy in the first quarter of this year, people are going to view you. As like a smart one. As a smart one. Like, yes. like everyone's viewing the people that bought in 2020 now. Yes. So be part of that group. And uh, may I talk about an even bigger issue really fast? Of course. Because we're talking about 2024, first quarter, all of these things. But in reality, the big picture that kind of starts to freak me out, and you're a parent, and I'm a parent, and I think people really need to be freaking talking about, is home prices. You know, I'm, I'm such a visual person again, and this is going to be backwards, so I don't know if I do this way, if it's going to look right on here. But um, the housing market always kind of does this thing, right? Mm -hmm. We're doing the dips. And we had a dip. But we're already back from that, you know, and yeah. it's just kind of like this ever tricking, you know, tick up. So homes appreciate over time. We all know this. Like, let's stop thinking about market crashes because we all know home prices are going up and up and up. Well, we've just had a year where we kind of stabilized because, well, we were spoiled brats for too many years of a super low bottom of the bottom dollar interest rate. Yep. And then all of a sudden we had like a kind of a normal interest rate and everybody was like, whoa. Oh, that's yeah. too much. And then it's ticking down a little bit, and now people are wanting to buy. But what's happening is home prices are continuing to go up, and they're actually now at a point where I think there's this huge divide that's going to happen in our country. And this is like a 10-year like a so perspective, right? So let's try for a second to view what that graph's going to look like over 10 years or 20 years. And over 10 years or 20 years, I think that we're going to – home ownership is going to be like a gold brick. It's going to be like something that not everybody has. Yep. And so 20 years from now, you're going to be like, I own, you know, 20 houses. It, that's going to sound like you own a million or you own a house. And you're like, whoa, you own your house? Because we really are um, creating a renter nation right now. 100%. And people are either right now. And so 2024, I think, is actually <laughs> also uh, it's a it's a. A, a whatever a why in the road mm -hmm. and it's either if you're in a renter boat now yeah. get out and by all means so i don't have enough money or my credit's not there ask the questions i am so sorry just that's to get my kids you could push an x on that <laughs> i don't know if you could split the the top right corner you're okay my kids will be picked up today. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, so it's if you're in the renter boat, it's it's by any means possible. I actually feel like it's that dire. 
So ask the hard question to the parent if you can borrow the money for the down payment or if they can qualify with you to get your first house. Like ask the hard questions. It's so funny. It's so funny, Jason. When I first started buying homes, I wanted to do everything myself because everybody thought that I was stupid and I was like doing it. Looking back now, I would have been like, who wants to partner with me? Let's yeah, do this. I know. I would have asked everybody to come in and partner with me, but we didn't know. So right now, it's all about the the that why in the road. I think a lot of renters are going to be stuck forever in that boat if they don't maybe ask some hard questions if they're not perfectly primed to buy. Mm-hmm. Maybe even buy with a family friend or a friend and, and own something together. Together would be better than nothing, you know? Yeah, you got to get in because... You got to get in. You got to get in or you're going to miss out. Yeah, it's, it's a tidal wave of like appreciation and prices continuing to go up. Yeah. And so if you, don't, like if you don't get on the wave, like to use a surfing analogy, if you don't get on the wave to ride it, you're never going to be able to paddle faster than it. Yes. Right? So you're just, you're going to be stuck. Yes. You're never going to get on top. Yes. So it's your only opportunity. Yeah. And I, and I do feel like, and, and the bad comments will be like, of course there's a realtor saying that you need to buy a house because that's what they always They're say. They're always going to say that. Yeah. Don't care. Um, keep sticking to that mentality and be stuck in the renter boat. I'm trying to say like, and this is an even bigger topic, which I'll, I'll leave you with, but think about your children. So for all the families out there that have children, your children's first home purchase is probably going to be $700,000 or $800,000. They're not going to be able to buy at the 24-year-old age that you were. They're probably going to be 42. So the age th- that they're going to be able That's to true. buy a home is going to be later. The value that they're going to buy at is going to be higher. So parents out there, I would like to like just kind of leave you with this. What could you be doing now? Could you even be buying a condo or a town home and attaching their name to it so they have this – asset that could build wealth over time and if they want to go to college then you sell that asset and hand them the hundred and fifty thousand dollars and say go to college or if they don't and they want a down payment at 35 go guess what that town home over here that i've had that's yours so if you want to sell that and use it as a down payment that's yours like we need to be thinking that way i agree completely yeah the time is now there's the the crash has been predicted for ever there's yeah. gonna be another crash another, there hasn't been another crash yeah and that was its own specific unique thing so i agree with you you, you got to get in now or it's gonna be impossible yeah yep. well thanks felicia i really appreciate you coming on today and carving out some time for us today it was of awesome course. having you on the show thank, thank you, you so for much. having me you bet